Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, Peter Berry, Chemistry Australia, AU Operation Clean Sweep Ready. Peter is Director of Strategy, Energy and Research, as well as the Company Secretary at Chemistry Australia. He has a diverse background with 42 years experience across the plastics manufacturing, again started young. Association Manager and Emergency Services Sector. He is responsible for supporting sustainable industry growth and competitiveness through development and prosecution of the industry's strategic plan. I've already had some of those beers, by the way. It's, it's energy, circular economy, innovation and research programs. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, Graeme. Good afternoon. I'd like to say thanks very much to the conference organisers for literally putting me on between yourselves and beer. I've been doing the, um, the speaking round for about 20 years. It's the first time I've literally stood between an audience and beer, figuratively speaking, out in the lobby, yes. So the instructions from Michelle are you can look, you can laugh, but you're not allowed to touch. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go. Look, thanks very much to Michelle and the board uh, for the opportunity to uh, be with you all today. Um, my background, uh, as has been mentioned, has always been in the industry. So I started off as a, as a fitter tool maker at Repco, uh, tool and die setter, uh, and then worked through uh, research and development, plant management, um, and I've done projects in Australia, Ireland, um, uh, the USA and Germany. So uh, I've, got, I've got industry in my blood, I've got resin in my blood, um, and so it's great to be here. When I think back um, about the majority of my work in plastics policy, the Australian rotor model industry has got a really important role. Australians consume about four and a half million tonnes of resin a year. And most of the policy settings are around single-use plastic. So if we think of that four and a half million tonnes, two thirds of that is imported finished goods. The other third is produced by companies like yourselves. The resin manufacturer and the powder manufacturer comes from here or it's imported, but it's transformed by your companies, by your employees and your businesses. And you've got a really important story to tell and uh, Michelle and myself are going to catch up in a couple of weeks about how we tell that story uh, even more. Because from a durable perspective, as a material that's durable, long term, has got a great environmental footprint compared to the alternatives, certainly getting on the government's agenda that the Australian plastics industry is fit for business. Uh, and we'll work through some of that, the headwinds that we'll all be facing. But I just want to acknowledge the work that you do, because plastics can get a bit of a rounds of the kitchens from time to time. Uh, but from our perspective, the work that you all do within your businesses really makes a difference, and I commend that to you. The other person I wanted to have a shout out to is Larissa. Where's Larissa? Thank you for talking openly about mental health. Uh, my side hustle, I'm involved with emergency services. We unfortunately had um, a colleague take his life last week. So uh, it is real and you really don't know where it is. So having those proactive programs and being able to talk openly at forums like this, so uh, well done and, and, and please take that to heart. So we want to talk about, so we've got an issue that all of us need to face and it doesn't matter where you are in the value chain, the focus of the government and on the community is on all of us. So I've been around the industry 40 plus years and these things annoy me because people uh, think that um, uh, they're picking on just our businesses. But we'll go through some of the logic in a moment and the good news is that there's something we can do about it. I'd also I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the leadership of Tangaroa Blue and, and, and Heidi Tate, who some of you may have met, who runs um, Operation Clean Suite, where, where they're their licensee partner. And um, they do a great job. This is a flesh-footed shearwater. They're found off Lord Howe Island, and when their chicks start to fledge, um, they'll pick up whatever food they can, they can get. So they start with things small that they can ingest, and they, that includes, uh, in other people's language, noodles or plastic pellets, or resin, or dust, or fibres, and they keep eating. And they keep eating until they eventually die, because they suffocate and they ended up, uh, they get necropsies like this. This is not an isolated incident. You may have seen these before, they are real, I've seen the necropsies myself. And so uh, one lens on our industry, not the whole lens, one lens on our industry is that uh, we're partly to blame for this. That may make you feel uncomfortable and I get that, 
as someone who faces uh, and speaks with federal and state environment ministers on behalf of the industry. So uh, I feel your discomfort, but it's a conversation we need to have nonetheless. We'll look in a minute at the, uh, the UN treaty that's about to be negotiated, but uh, Houston, we have a problem. So if you look at where plastics came from, in the 1860s, we were slaughtering about 60,000 elephants a year as feedstock to make billiard balls. And so we had to come up with a viable alternative. So the Phelan and Calendar uh, Billiard Ball Company in New York, um, got John Wesley Hyatt and his brother to make uh, cellulose uh, nitrate, which then became cellulose acetate, and that's how plastics were born. And looks like we've been doing a pretty good job ever since of making plastics. But the world's lens on us is that we're making a lot and we don't recycle enough and we don't look after our products enough. For me, stewardship comes in two flavours. Flavour number one is the materials that we use and then the products that we use at end of life. So they're not my stats, that's um, been produced by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the World Wildlife Fund. Every government's got a copy of that report. And that's the concern is we're using more plastic to meet legitimate demand, but a lot of that plastic at the end of life isn't ending up where it needs to be. And it's increasingly uh, being part of the ecosystem. Um, we were part of the negotiations in the um, the UN Treaty in Nairobi, and when the head of the United Nations Environment Program said, I went and got a blood test the other day and there were microplastics in my bloodstream, and he's about to head the negotiations up for the UN Treaty, uh, just to give you a heads up that that's where the UN is. So that treaty um, will start the negotiations in Uruguay in November, and that'll be the, um, the first ever global um, uh, treaty on plastic pollution. Uh, there have been Side issues such as the Stockholm Convention, people who work with additives will, will be aware and conscious of that. Uh, but this will be the, um, the plastics industry's Paris moment. So in two or three years' time, I think it'll be 2025, not 2024, there will be a global agreement that our, that our government will sign on to about plastic pollution. And so the opportunity for all of us is to do things which are within our span of control. We can't control those things outside our span of control, but the good news is, we can deal with those things within our span of control. So um, that'll be negotiated by, there's, there's probably 76 countries um, that are working pretty hard. Um, there's a block out of uh, Norway and uh, another block out of uh, Rwanda and Peru who are particularly uh, vocal about the need to limit resin production and to stop making more plastic because you've got enough, you haven't recycled as much as you said you would. So how can more plastic in the oceans possibly be a good thing? So that's what, uh, that's my day job, that's fine, um, but that's just to give you a realistic assessment uh, about where things are at. The other thing that's happening at the moment is the IMO, or the International Marine Organization, is working um, with a proposal from Norway to have plastic pellets de declared as a class nine dangerous good under the environmental provisions of, uh, of class nine. So whether it's the, um, in June 2021, you may have seen off the coast of Sri Lanka, there was the Express Pearl Fire, where plastic resin was, uh, was disgorged into the ocean uh, and created a massive problem. You'll also see that sperm whale. So if you Google in uh, plastic marine waste, you may see a picture of that whale, and that's what everybody else sees as well. That was actually an art installation done by Greenpeace um, in Indonesia off the back of an necropsy that was done off a sperm whale in Spain two years earlier where there was 30 kilograms of, uh, of plastic waste in the sperm whale's stomach. So it's pretty easy to, to, to Google plastic waste and you'll see images just like that. If people don't know better about our industry, uh, that's one lens that they view us through. Again, you don't need to like it. Uh, I certainly don't, but we do need to, uh, to be aware uh, that that's people's view of our industry. So domestically, how are we faring? So, certain, so these are, these are real live action shots for, uh, from Melbourne, right? Uh, so uh, Australia still has an, an, an ongoing problem, whether it's pellet, powder, flake, we're still having loss that goes into the environment. Pellet loss during manufacturing, uh, having worked in a store um, as part of an apprenticeship. Hands up who hasn't run a forklift time or two through the occasional bag on the bottom left hand corner, right, we've all done it. So uh, there you go. Uh, the issue is, um, what are we going to do about it? So whether it's uh, damage during manufacturing, we are losing pellet, resin and flake through our fence lines. And the EPA have got quite an interest in that. We are losing it off our trucks. 
From there, it goes into the community stormwater drain where it becomes the EPA's issue to manage. And then it gets down into places like uh, Stony Creek. So if you go to that, uh, that pond under the Westgate Bridge near Science Works, um, it won't take you long to have a look around there and you'll see plenty of, uh, of pellets aggregating because uh, I get the emails back to try and help uh, uh, typify and classify what it is and where it came from. Can you help me? So um, it is an ongoing problem and there's also pellet loss going into Port Phillip Bay. So, you know, Houston, do we have a problem? Not on the scale of uh, entire container loads off the Sri Lankan coast. Uh, but no, make no mistake, uh, the industry is, is on notice that we are losing pellets, we are losing scrap, uh, and as you'll see in a moment, there's, uh, there's some work to, uh, uh, to be done about that. A couple of things I've learned um, of, uh, in tw let's call it 20-something years in uh, industry associations, is the, the, uh, the golden rules of stewardship. So if we're frustrated by the bad press that our industry gets, and I get it, uh, as I said, that's, that's my 24 7, 365 day job. The good news is that there are actions that we can take to improve people's perception of us and our industry. Marie McCaskill used to run um, a, uh, a not for profit in the space. She said, Peter, it's very simple. Product stewardship has got three golden rules go voluntary, go hard, and go early. She said, You don't have to, you know, choose your own adventure. But if you don't, and the problem's significant enough and you don't sort it out yourself, then the government will do it for you and you won't like it and it'll be ill-fitting and you complain about the regulation that you've had to suffer as a result. So Marie's advice to me, which has stayed with me ever since, is go voluntary, go hard and go early. Now that's also backed up, if you have a look at the Council of Australian Governments, they've got a mechanism for regulatory intervention where there's been a market failure and they'll work through uh, voluntary measures Co-regulatory measures and the, uh, the Australian Packaging Covenant is, uh, is an example of a co-regulatory mechanism and then there's mandatory measures. So we get to choose our own adventure still because we're in the space where we can still make a difference about how we're perceived. So for me, there is stewardship of two things. Stewardship of our materials, the inputs that, that, that go into our plants, and then the stewardship of our products at end of life, uh, both are just as important. So Operation Clean Sweep is a global program. Uh, it's been going since 1992. Uh, the, the Plastics Industry Association and now what's, what is the, the American Chemistry Council uh, have been looking after that. It's implemented in 22 uh, jurisdictions uh, and I saw the V-Plus stand out the front with the Operation Clean Sweep signed off by, uh, by Cousin Rachel uh, over in New Zealand. So uh, hats off, good job. Um, and it's pretty simple. Pellets, powder, grinds should be con uh, contained, reclaimed and they should be properly used, they shouldn't be disposed of. So that was introduced into Australia in 2015. Um, the two years of lockdown have meant that a lot of us didn't get the traction on a lot of programs that we would like, but there you go. Um, but more work needs to be done. So along with Tangaroa Blue, we're the joint licence holders and certainly our board um, has made a commitment at board level uh, that members will implement that and I know the Armour Board uh, has taken a great leadership step in recognising what the problem is on your behalf and working towards um, your organisation signing up to this as well. And so hats off to, to Michelle and to the board for taking that leadership position and working towards something which at the end of the day is a pretty good uh, practice for not only leadership, uh, but it's just good housekeeping and it just makes good sense. Our board and Tangaroa Blue thought that it was important enough um, program that we get this built into the National Waste, uh, the National Plastics Plan. So the National Plastics Plan is part of the National Waste Policy Action Plan, uh, which the federal government looks after and Minister Plibersek uh, administers uh, via her agencies. Now, what was interesting is uh, the Auditor General did an audit of uh, the National Waste Policy Action Plan the other day and they said, by and large, the bureaucrats are doing okay, but the thing that's holding up progress is a lack of, is a lack of metrics, measures and progress. Okay, so first thing to understand. The second thing is when we've spoken with Minister Plibersek's office, um, are you going to retain the National Plastics Plan? The answer is yes, but we know that there's some process going on. We really need to see more action. So I can guarantee that plastic businesses in Australia will be under a higher degree of scrutiny than what they have before, not only because the National Plastics Plan has been in, in place for a while, 
It wasn't the minister's plan, so uh, if she's going to retain somebody else's plan, she wants to make sure that it's going to work. Add on to that the focus of the UN Treaty and add on to that um, the, uh, the push by Norway to have plastic pellets uh, classified as a dangerous goods. We'll have more pressure on our industry and more visibility around our social licence. The good news is, is it's within our control. So our board and Tangaroa Blue were quite happy to include specifically Operation Clean Sweep uh, front and centre in the, uh, in the National Plastics Plan. And we're quite happy to stand by that. That's under Section 4, Oceans and Waterways. We're also part of CSIRO's Mission to End Plastic Waste, which has got a target of 80% reduction in plastic waste going into the environment by 2030. That's probably the most aggressive target uh, that's been set around the world, entirely achievable. And we're working with CSIRO, the government and industry to, uh, to make that a reality. Victorian EPA, for those of you who are, who are Victorians, if you're from other states, uh, the EPA is not far away because they're looking at mirroring this legislation in at least New South Wales and Queensland and probably WA. So in 2021, they put a, a general provision in to assess the risk and to demonstrate that you've actually done something about that risk. Unfortunately, Operation Clean Sweep is specifically called out as Operation Clean Sweep provides a valuable and detailed guide on managing issues with plastic pellets. So generally when we put programs in place, we'll work with the regulators to, to say, do you think this is a reasonable thing uh, to do? Do you think it lines up with what your expectations are? Do you think it provides the sort of resources that practically companies can use? And they said yes. So we got it included in the provisions. So if you're wondering how you go about showing that you've assessed your risk, and you've done something about the risk, Operation Clean Sweep is one way of doing that. You don't have to use Operation Clean Sweep, but it's a program there that's been made available uh, and it works. Um, because that general obligation um, is something that they'll be tracking down more. And as I said, as we start those negotiations in November in Uruguay, there'll be more emphasis on, on the industry and the EPAs around the world will be coordinating their efforts about what they can do to make sure that Australia and other nations who will sign up to that treaty are doing all the things that they can reasonably do. And Operation Clean Sweep is something that, that, they can, that you can reasonably do. So what is it? Uh, it's a simple, good housekeeping guide that allows you to demonstrate uh, leadership. We've got about 50 plus signatories, so the website's about to be updated. And we sort of categorise those into association, problem manufacturers, uh, transport and storage, uh, fabricators and converters, and also recyclers. So loss can occur at each stage of that. And you know, logically, if you work through the supply chain of resin or powder coming into your facility, being converted into a product, that transport and logistics, as I said, forklift driver um, uh, nicks the bag on the way through, and many of us have done it, then, then that's where it leads to uh, being washed down the drains. Um, so it is important that all, all parts of that value chain play their role. So because it looks at that total supply chain involvement globally, uh, we're putting that up to the, the International Maritime uh, Organisation through, through the Australian arm, which is AMSA, the Australian uh, Maritime Safety Authority. The programs like Operation Clean Sweep is what industry can do to avoid plastic resin being classified as a dangerous good. So the option is that um, at the International Maritime uh, Organisation level, they say, fine, we will classify it and the costs will go up uh, in terms of how we deal with plastic resin, or we can provide them with uh, an industry-based program that makes common sense to us in terms of greater transparency around what they're carrying, where they place it on the ship, how the containers are secured, and if it does get loose, we'll use Operation Clean Sweep to look after our part of the deal. So everyone's got responsibility through that chain of custody and some of that's on us uh, to play our role as well. But the shipping uh, companies need to play their part as well. So we really are all in it together. It speaks for itself. So the good news is it's relatively painless. Um, it's, it's clear and simple branding. And look, we're used to setting goals. Once upon a time, um, we were wondering why on earth how on earth can we possibly set a zero injury goal because people go to work and they hurt themselves? We just heard Larissa talk about how we treat mental health the same way that we used to treat physical health. 
lower back injuries, who's, who's got a crook back from lifting the wrong way. So we all accept that we can set goals within industry where, where zero is an achievable goal. This is also an achievable goal that is well within our span of control and well within our reach. We know how to do this stuff. We do it every day of the week. So what are the benefits to us? We reduce the number of pellet spills. We avoid regulatory fines for spillages. Uh, we'll be under more scrutiny, not less. Um, it's a safe place for people to work. We're talking about absenteeism and getting people to work in our industry. Matching up our employees' values with the standards that we hold us to is a great part about being a leader because people want to come to work. It's another thing that works for us. It increases efficiency. So given where resin prices are heading because of oil prices, uh, I'm assuming that uh, every gram you get in, you'd rather uh, put through to a, a product. You'd rather not have it uh, down the drain. Uh, literally down the drain. It enhances your reputation uh, as a steward, reduces danger, and you take that voluntary approach. I've been involved in plenty of government campaigns where regulation was imposed on us. It wasn't pretty. We didn't like it. Uh, and the cost is just extraneous because they didn't understand our industry when they imposed it. This is the opportunity to get ahead of the curve. And I reckon in a room like this full of leaders, this is as much about how we choose to demonstrate our leadership. Uh, and be proactive in a space that we can control. So how do you do it? It's pretty simple. You hop onto the website and uh, Hattie will send you out uh, a form where you simply commit to making zero pellet loss. Sign up on the pledge. It's painless. Um, you don't have to wait until you've got everything done and everything in place just because, well, well I'll wait a couple of years until I get all the litter traps in place and I get everything. Sign up and then get the work done. Okay, it really doesn't hurt. You're not exposing yourself to any, any liability. So if the EPA comes knocking on the door and says, G'day Bob, all that resonant, oh yeah, well there's this Operation Clean Sweep program, we're gonna get around to it, but you haven't actually signed on, so as an EPA inspector, I'm not really sure what that means. So um, I know the board's got a view, uh, and quite rightly, that uh, the industry needs to sign up uh, by the end of 2023. And I think I worked out the other day, that's one company a week uh, for the next 64 weeks. Uh, so I hope that you'll, uh, you'll rise to the, uh, the opportunity. So the good news is there's some uh, program checklists and pledges. These were taken from the US industry. They were converted in into Australian by a, a very good looking young bloke who'd been around the industry for a couple of years when Haiti asked me. And I hope they make sense. If they don't, please let us know and we'll change the wording and the context so that it does make sense to your industry. Uh, but they're pretty practical guides about how you can identify where it is, where it's going, and how you can remediate it. There's also a rating program, a one to five rating program, where as you can see there, one's, uh, one's pretty good, five's pretty terrible. So you can audit your site uh, over time and see, are we doing any better? Are we doing any worse? And going to that point that, that uh, Larissa made before about getting people engaged in the program, uh, if this is something that uh, our employees own, rather than something else that management tells them to do, uh, then it's a good program. Because having been uh, an old maintenance fitter uh, and not understanding why my brilliantly re-engineered machine made so much sense, but I didn't ask the operator, uh, and they'd actually solved the problem about five times before, uh, but I didn't ask them because I was young and naive. So working with our employees and getting them to own it uh, makes a lot of sense as well. Uh, happy campers, clean places, uh, and you, you get a badge on your gate, and EPA will increasingly be looking for that. Some of the innovation we've found has been really good too, like who'd have thought that if you, um, that if you run resin around in trucks uh, and you have a spill, rather than getting out the compressed air gun, you get out a vacuum and you vacuum it up rather than getting, right, I oh, know, it's sort of like, oh yeah, that's probably a good idea. So we're having a network of, uh, now that we're uh, not spending life on a 13 inch computer screen, we'll have a network of those good ideas about, well, how did you solve your problem? How did you so serve your, solve yours? Uh, why don't we do the same? So we are all in it together and there's nothing wrong with, um, with sharing good ideas. So Hades given me a list of barriers to taking the pledge. So here's the feedback that we get from people in terms of, no, we've got it under control, uh, we don't need to join because we're doing it. Well, that's fine, and you can choose that. But as I said, if you, um, if you think about those headwinds that are coming at us all in terms of greater scrutiny, it's a pretty easy program to sign on 
and take a sense of pride in our industry and take a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, collective ownership as well. We'll consider it if time goes by, and usually that's exactly what happens. Time goes by uh, and we get swamped with all the other things that people expect to do uh, as business owners, and they're all compelling and they're all important and they all compete for our space and our time, and, uh, and we get that. Um, but it is a, an easy thing to sign on to. We're getting our house in order and we'll get there. So I know companies that, that have taken that, that view and they've been really, really concerned that I don't want to sign up until I've got everything absolutely nailed. And time did go by. Whereas you sign up, no one's going to put you in the crosshairs. It's just a matter of signing up and being able to, uh, to kick on. So look, that's the, that's the presentation. Uh, again, I, I thank very much uh, Heidi Tate uh, for doing um, the, the bulk of the lifting. Uh, they're a great NGO. Uh, but they've been doing the bulk of the lifting for our industry as an NGO. So um, we'll be doing a, a bit more work in that space. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if, if that's OK. Um, happy to answer difficult and uncomfortable questions. That's all fine. Or not. Yes, there is. So Operation Clean Sweep is run in New Zealand. So cousin Rachel runs out, out of uh, Plastics New Zealand. Uh, and she's red hot as well. So uh, have a chat to Rachel, and uh, she'll be more than happy to uh, to sign you up. No, going, going, gone. Thanks for your time, folks.